Okay. My wife wishes she had a mute button for me, but she doesn't. <laughs> All right, we're going to be in John chapter 4 this morning. And as I let you know last week, we are um, doing a little bit different this week because we do travel verse by verse through God's Word probably 95% of the time. And uh, this time, or last week, we actually covered uh, the woman at the well. But Jesus makes a statement during his time with the woman at the well. He makes a statement about worship. He who, you know, the Lord is spirit and he is truth and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So why don't we go ahead and pray and we'll get into the study this morning as we look at worship. Dear God, I pray that this morning we get it that we understand it is about you. And then it is about you and us. And then it's about everything else. Lord, may we not be that church that left its first love because they forgot to worship and what it was about. And Lord, whatever any other church may do, Lord, may we just here today learn a little bit more about what it means to truly be a worshiper of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Warren Worsby said this about worship. He said, worship is the submission of all our nature to God. You see, it's more than just song, right? It is a quickening of our conscience by his holiness. It's a nourishment of mind with his truth. It's a purifying of the imagination by his beauty. It's the opening of the heart to his love. It's a surrender of the will to his purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable, and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. It's more than just a few songs, isn't it? See, in there, it's the submission. It's the, it's the conscience. It's, it's nourishing your mind with his truth. It's washing the water of the word. Your time just in God's word is a form of worship unto the Lord. And purifying your imagination, the training to cap- take every thought captive is a way to worship the Lord. Obviously, your heart, we'll talk about that. And the surrender of your will, saying, I feel like doing it my way, but I'm going to do it your way because you're God and I'm not. And all of that just works in our life to bring a wholehearted surrender and incredible transformation of our lives. Christianity, guys, is worship. It's worship of God in every facet of your life. And so we're going to look at a lesson in worship this morning in verse 21 through uh, 24. And in reverence to the word of God, why don't we go ahead and stand up? We don't always do that, but we'll stand up and read God's word and then get into the teaching this morning. John chapter 4, verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming... And now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You may be seated. So again, many think of the word worship meaning only music. And you hear people say this, wow, I really enjoyed the worship this morning. Now, as holy as you think I might be, I'm really not. I'm sarcastic inside, and I'm sorry for that, and I'm working on it, because I figured out years ago that sarcasm is not a gift of the Spirit. Bummer, because I'd be really holy, (laughs) right? (laughs) And so when people say, man, I really enjoyed the worship this morning, in my mind I go, well, I'm glad you did, but it's not for you, right? Because people say, I really enjoyed it. And and so with that attitude in mind, I know what people are saying, and I've said the same phrase, so I'm not just trying to cap on you and be rude. But what is your heart really towards worship? 
Because the true heart towards worship, when worship happens, and it's not always perfect, there's a spirit of worship and there's a spirit of brokenness that takes place in someone's heart, even if they're not completely on tune. Even if their guitar playing, the playing of the instruments isn't completely perfect, there's a heart that comes out as someone is leading worship that includes all these things that we were talking about. And so you feel it. You feel someone that has a heart of worship, and you also notice pretty quickly when someone has a heart of performance, don't you? If you know how to worship the Lord, and are you practicing it yourself? You recognize what a counterfeit is, even if the words and the songs are right. But the attitude needs to be this. I really enjoyed worshiping the Lord today. When someone leads you well in worship, you can say that. I really enjoyed worshiping the Lord today. Instead of, I really enjoyed the worship today, right? And you can say, I, I really enjoyed the worship today. We'll know what you mean. But you see what I'm saying? The difference. Where, where is your heart there? I really enjoyed worshiping today. I, I enjoy it when so-and-so leads worship because I'm worshiping the Lord, not them. Not the song. Not worshiping my entertainment feel that I get because I've been entertained because people are talented. Or this, I was blessed at how the Lord was glorified in service today. You know, to a worship team that truly is worshiping the Lord, you just say, I am so blessed at how you glorified God when you were leading worship today. Isn't that cool? And that's what we need to make sure our heart is at. Because the problem I have today with, with modern worship is when I rededicated my heart to the Lord in 1988, you had contemporary Christian music, right? And then you had, you had gospel music and you had praise music. And they were sep separate realms. But what is all contemporary Christian music today? Almost all of it is now worship music at the same time, isn't it? And so that starts to confuse our minds on whether we go to church to be a consumer of the worship or to be consumed in worship. And there's a huge difference in that, right? And, and, and so, you know, in our church, we want everybody to be able to partake and to, to learn how to do it. And so we have incredible people that are radically talented but every person we put up here, whether they're incredibly talented or not, we want them to be a worshiper. And so we look for the heart before we look for the talent in our church because we want to have God's heart. Because as we give it to the Lord, it might be someone who's incredibly talented and it's a beautiful worship, and, and anybody in the world would say that's incredible. But if someone has a heart for worship, I love to worship when they're leading worship. See what I'm saying? See, what, see, see where that, that goes? Because the heart is right. And so, again, it's not just song. And so we're going to look at three ancient words that, that I, I think sum up what um, worship is about. Two of them are Greek. One of them is Hebrew. And then I'm going to give you six more words out of the Hebrew that talk about worship because God is all about worship, right? But it involves bowing, loving, and serving. Number one, bowing. The word is, okay, it depends on how you want to say it, but shaka in the Hebrew, but we'll call it shaka, to bow down, to prostrate oneself before the Lord. And it's a humbling and it's a laying down before the Lord. And the first time we see this is in Genesis 22, verse 5. And the context is this, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and the lad, his son, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. That word worship is we are going to lay our lives down before the throne of God to do whatever he wants us to do. And is that true? If you don't know the story, God was asking him to be willing to sacrifice the son of the promise, the son of his old age, the son that was a miracle. And he needed to be willing to trust God so much that he was going to sacrifice. And so the idea ultimately of bowing is to absolutely surrender yourself to the Lord. You know, sometimes we say bow your heads. That's a distraction thing, right? You know, you don't want to, you know, but, but the posture really is bow your hearts before the Lord. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. And you hear that phrase, and that phrase makes sense to me. Let's, let's surrender to the Lord as we come before him. And in a way, it's losing or admitting defeat. We don't want to do that. 
But remember with me, one of the great stories of the Bible is you got this guy named Jacob, which is heel catcher. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to manipulate things to happen my way. And he wrestles with God overnight by the brook Jabbok. And he loses. And then his name becomes governed by God or Israel. Jacob became Israel because he surrendered to God. And you know what? All of us uh, are, are identified as the rebellious wrestlers with God, right? Until we surrender to God, and then we're children of God. And so that term surrender means like just to absolutely give in. And we learn to surrender to God. And we do it at first when we say, I can't do it my way. I have to do it your way. I cannot be saved if I do it my own way. That's surrender. But through our whole life, we surrender again and again and again. And so that idea of surrender is huge. A.W. Tozer, the reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. They're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work within us. And so you need to understand it doesn't have to be physically getting on your knees, but it's actually your will. In fact, a lot of people will bow with their knees, but their hearts puffed up. That can happen, right? Because they're trying to impress people that are looking, but God knows. It's when your heart actually finally just gives in. Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ. Oops, did I skip that one? Okay, well, I'll quote it here. <laughs> Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ. He founded it. Through his ministry, it's estimated that 150 million people gave their hearts to the Lord. But Bill Bright was asked, why did God use you and bless your life so much? And he answered this way. He says, when I was a young man, I made a contract with God, and I literally wrote it out, and I same, signed my name at the bottom, and it said, from this day forward, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Whatever God wants from me. He didn't go out to plan to make his name big. He went out to make the name of the Lord big. And the Lord was the one that raised him up. And I tell you what, behind the scenes, it wasn't easy on him. We have a, a man named Bill Glass. He spoke at our church a couple of different times, but he runs prison ministry. And uh, he was a former professional football player from Corpus Christi. And and, and I think he's graduated Ray High School, but he spoke at our, our, our church a few times. And he says, when I was a young man, Bill Bright was older. And, uh, and I got real close with Bill, with Bill Bright because he brought Campus Crusade to Baylor's campus. And, and he was meeting with Bill Bright as he was doing that. And um, he said, you would not believe the attack that Bill Bright went through on his own boy and how Satan would get into people's hearts and minds. And he said, the only defense Bill Bright ever offered was, if God doesn't want me here, God just needs to show me, and I will leave everything behind. And that's the only thing he ever said to defend himself. And the people were bringing up all kinds of crazy accusations against him, and he said, if God doesn't want me here, all God has to do is show me. And they had no evidence for it, but it was just crazy, and his name was just drugged through the mud. But what he said, it doesn't matter. Slaves don't have rights, do they? And he didn't fight back because he was surrendered to God. And if God was on his side, that was good enough. Okay? Now think about Paul. He wrote this, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. You know, and so... Actually, I put it there. Did I put it there? Okay, in verse 23, I'm sorry. But verse 23 says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. So he says it twice. I combined it there. Sorry about that. In chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says the same thing almost word for word twice. And what is he saying? He's saying, I have the freedom to exert my own will and have enough grace to save me. I have the freedom to do that. So I can give my heart to the Lord and I can exert my will. And I can, I can grieve the Holy Spirit. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Why? Because he's already brought under the power of God. And a sin that he's going to allow willfully into his life will put him under that power, not under God's. 
And that's what sin does, right? Sin causes us to choose sin's way instead of God's way, doesn't it? You know, you, you got a husband and he's making a choice and you don't like the choice. And you're going, you know. And, and sin will say, you fight tooth and nail. But the word of God would say, you know what, trust your husband right now. If it's not sin, just trust your husband. And, and if you can't do that, you know, and you're struggling with it, go make an appointment at the church. Talk to some of the elders and, and their wife, and, and let them mediate. But surrender to something. You know, surrender a little bit. Because I tell you what, I've never met a happy, rebellious wife. But don't women think that that's going to bring them joy? Take down that man, right? Oh, and he chose one of the hardest ones, right? Second service, I'll probably get a you know, pump stuck in my forehead, you know. <laughs> Just joking. But listen, the road to happiness or excuse me, happiness is found on the road to holiness. Happiness is not found by chasing happiness, right? Chasing your own way and your own will. But then he says in verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. And he knows his father's heart. God the father's heart is to love people. And if I'm going to do something selfishly that's going to hurt people, I I'm not going to do it. In my devotions yesterday or the day before, I was in Revelation chapter 13, and I think it's verse 10, and it said, all who, lead, all who lead others into captivity will be led into captivity. And I go, whoa. You know, I mean, that's a heavy verse, right? You know, and, and so that surrender says, God, I have, I have, you know, you can still let me sin, but, but to surrender says, God, I want to try to do things your way. And so when you're battling, and, and God is so good with us, isn't he? Because, because, you know, early on, they're like the big sins, you know. I'm beating up people on the street, and I just got saved. Probably should stop doing that, you know. I cuss like a sailor. Sorry, sailors. But I cuss like a sailor, and, and, and you know, I, maybe I should stop doing that now, you know. And, and that's one of the big, you know, Ten Commandments or whatever. But then over time, it becomes more subtle, and God gives us more, and he gives us more. And he gives us more to the point where you realize you've been walking with the Lord for 30 years and you're like, wow, I still have so much to go, like way more than I even thought. But it humbles you. And now you're working on details as opposed to grand things. And God doesn't throw it all at you all at once because he's going to love you. All things are lawful for me because I've been covered in the blood of blood of Christ. But he moves you along slowly and he's so gracious in the way that he does does that. And that's why I would ask, you know, has, has anybody in this room sinned this week? Well, it's only Sunday, so you're pretty bad. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> no. But let's just say in the last seven days, we'd all have to raise our hands. And if I was truly a legalist, I'd have to say, okay, get out of here because we can't have you, that, that, that leaven in this room. That'd be ridiculous, right? But for the sake of the Lord and yourself, you need to adopt this attitude. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body the living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Is it bad to give in to the things of the Lord? What are the ramifications of it? I mean, sometimes it hurts. Most of the time, our flesh freaks out, right? We don't like it that way. But I tell you what, it draws us near, and it puts us on a path towards eternity. And so that, that idea of surrender, that, that Hebrew word of bowing down before the Lord. Now, the second one has to do with loving, okay? And the word loving is the word proskuno, which you would recognize more as the Greek. And and what it means is to kiss the hand towards or to turn the face towards in, in, in reverence. And this is where you get the term worship means to kiss the face of God. It means to really adore and love God to the point where you just want to be intimate with God. And, and, and that's like those intimate times that you have with God in prayer. That's like those intimate times that you have with God in worship. Those are like those intimate times that you're, you're meditating on God throughout the day and you're making choices to, to love God. 
And so he wants our relationship with him to be characterized by this idea of love. 1 John 3.16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we respond. In 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. And that's why it's important to be in God's word. Because, guys, I don't wake up in the morning saying, I'm just going to love God. And, you know, I can pretend that's true, but I'd be lying. Because I wake up, and I'm all rod. And and I'm flesh. But then I get back into the word of God. My spirit is quickened. It's encouraged. It's charged up. And I'm reminded of the things of God and how wise his word is and why I need to follow and what he's done for me. And, and, and just takes a few minutes, man, shot in the arm, and, and I, I become appreciative of God. And throughout your life, you, must, you, you should be growing in this, th- this freedom to actually love God in a real free way because you know more and more about him over time. And, and, and it's this willingness to be intimate with him. It's what drives everything, or should be, because Paul said the love of Christ, what, construct com- compels me or constrains me. And, and what he's saying is the love of Christ draws me into the center of his will. You know, it's like cows mulling around in a pen and you're trying to either dehorn them or you're going to try to get them out to milk. And cows are not orderly. They're just kind of like this, right? And our spirit isn't orderly without the Lord. Our spirit is just random and we go for what you know. If it feels right, do it. You know, and we're just bumping around in life. And, and, and you get to know the Lord, and all of a sudden, you, you get this, this spark in your heart of love. And then you start thinking, I want to please him. And, and then you start getting your life a little bit more in order. And, and that's the love of God constraining you in a proper direction. It's not the whip of God beating you into order. It's the love of God being those gates that push you into the center of God's will. And, and that's love. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments, so you'll start to be lined up within my will, because you love me back. Remember the church at Ephesus. They were a real busy church. But in Revelation 2, 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Your motivation for me, your motivation to do what you're doing is no longer love. You know, fo- you know you're no longer focused on what I've done for you and who I am. You're now focused on what you're doing, and it's making you feel good. You're not focused on being my child. You're focused on doing the stuff that makes you feel good. And you see how different that can be? It can look the same, right? You serve God, but you're serving God to feel good, or you're serving God because you love God. And it's very, very different. And so they have forgotten why they did what they did. But understand, Jesus never stops loving you, even if you drifted away a bit. Once you've received his covenant into your life, once you've received his blood, you're now his child, and he loves you. And sometimes you poop your panties, and he still loves you. You guys know I got a puppy last week. Sometimes he poops on the floor. He's a puppy. Sometimes he tinkles on the floor. He's a puppy. Now, if he's doing that as an adult dog, we're talking about, you know, from the pulpit all now. Does anybody need a dog? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with this dog, you know. But it's that type of love that is a love in marriage because when you have two people that are married, you have one has a bad day, the other one is going to encourage them and lift them up, you know, with that kind of love that says, I'm committed to, to you. I'm committed to your well-being. And so he wants it to be characterized I love. The third point or word is a Greek word, but it means to hire or to perform sacred services. Okay? And the idea is to live a life that honors God, that is useful to God. Ephesians 5 8, you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And that idea is walk as children of the light, as serve the Lord, worship the Lord, do things as unto him, as children of 
the Lord. And so this idea of serving the Lord in every area of your life is very important. And it may be, you know, doing things in the church, but certainly using what God gave you. You were born with certain talents, a disposition, an IQ, maybe good looks, maybe athletic ability. God gave that to you. Worship him with that. It may be spiritual gifts. It may be possessions that you've been able to accumulate over time that God wants you to use as unto him. And he's the one that created you and gave you breath. It's okay to do that. Again, you might glorify the Lord through athletic prowess. You might honor God by just being radically faithful at work and being that example. But it's more than just singing singing a song. And, And that's the point I want to get to. It's what you do every day to honor and serve him. All right, we're going to quickly go through these words. Barak. Barak is a Hebrew word. All these are Hebrew words from here on out. And it it speaks of silent praise from the heart or an inner attitude and contemplation of God. So sometimes it's just an attitude of the heart towards God. And the Lord knows what your heart is thinking and where your heart is. And so that's the only quiet one, actually. <laughs> but that's, that's the one. It's okay to be innerly contemplative and dwelling and meditating upon the goodness of God. You're worshiping him at that point. The word halal, well, we get hallelujah, <laughs> to shout, to celebrate, to rave, to boast, to sing loudly about the Lord. Okay? Hallelujah, praise be to God. Number three, yada means to throw out your hands. Chronicles 20, verse 21, and many other places And the idea is to throw out your hands, to touch the throne of God in a sense, a a thankful sense of praise. And todah means to lift your hands. And it's the most common word for thanks in Israel today. And it speaks of lifting your hands in thanks for what God is going to do. It's been said an outward lifting of the hands speaks of the inward lifting of the heart. So yada is kind of, giving. I want to give you praise, God. So when people raise their hands, they might be thinking, God, I just want, I want you to see my raised hands that I'm surrendered to you, and I, I want you to just receive this from me. And the other one, is God loves. Tauda is anticipating God's blessing to you. And so sometimes you lift your hands in worship like, I just need you, God. And you don't need to lift your hand, but we're physical and spiritual. And so even as we lift our hands sometimes like this, so sometimes my hand's like this, and I kind of feel like I'm giving praise to God. And sometimes my hands are like this saying, God, I receive everything that you have for me. And it's like a little kid saying, daddy, daddy, with expectation. Dada, you know, or mama. And so they're different. A lot of words. Zamara speaks of instrumental praise, and it means to touch the strings to celebrate in song. And shabach means to commend or to triumph to glory with a shout, like this is a victorious shout. And so he wants it to be expressive. You get the idea? He wants it to be quiet inner and expressive outer. People ought to know you're a believer, not fakely, not because it's your trend in the church and you got an emotional church, but because you have been tight with God and you can't keep it in. You can't keep it in because you love the Lord. And so this is what he wants and it's a showing of his worth i I used to go to the harvest crusades often in california Uh, a friend of mine uh, i used to work at harvest where greg laurie is the pastor and uh, he's the guy that evangelizes at the harvest crusades and one of my good friends worked there and uh, i actually was a school teacher there for a time as well and um, uh, being a youth pastor also a volunteer youth pastor at that time I got to sit on stage a few times, and it was really cool. At Angel Stadium, you know, he's going, wow, there's like 75,000 people here, all to see me. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, but just knowing that, that, that God had drawn a lot of unbelievers to go to a crusade, like, why would you do that? That's supernatural to begin with. And then there would be a time of worship before the message. And I'm thinking, I used to always think, why worship before the mes- message? These are unbelievers. Shouldn't you play like red hot chili peppers or something? I don't know, you know. These are unbelievers. And then I realized, 
when you truly worship, it is, it is a witness. Because people look at you and they say, what am I missing out on? Or they really believe that their God is worth worshiping. Maybe I should look into this. And so as you live a life of worship, whether it's silent inside, whether it's through your service, I mean, it should be all these, but, but whether it's vocally, uh, whether people hear you saying it out loud and saying, praise God, I cannot believe this happened, or whatever it is, you know, that people are ministered to. So he wants it to be wholehearted, expressive. You know, David danced in his underwear, you know? And he was just like, whatever, man. Wholeheartedly, his, his wife didn't get it, and she got mad at him. She says, oh, the king is dancing in his underwear. How disgraceful. And he says, no, a dude is dancing before the king in his underwear. It's not disgraceful. He, he was surrendered, and that's why he was a man after God's own heart. Now, in the passage we're looking at, it talks about spirit and truth. Okay? So Jesus says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Where are we going to worship the Father? When the Holy Spirit is sent out and dwells in you, you become what? The tabernacle of God. Worship no longer is centered in Jerusalem. It's centered in every believer that spreads out all over the whole earth. That's what he's saying there, right? Makes perfect sense. Talks about it a few chapters later as well, multiple times, John 14 through 16. But he says, you worship what you do not know, and we worship for what we worship. The salvation is from, well, excuse me, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now you need to understand, I believe in the gifts of, uh, for today. But some groups say that since God is spirit, that's referring to the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of true worship and salvation is speaking in tongues. Because I believe that tongues is a praise language and and so in that sense, they do have it right. It's a prayer praise language. Okay? But they say tongues is the evidence of true worship. But I think it means a lot more. Whenever you get dogmatic and you, you shut it down to one thing, a lot of times you're, you're limiting God. Because I want you to understand, it refers, it could refer also to the human spirit as well. And back in John chapter 4, he says, you're no longer going to worship on this mountain you're going to worship in tongues. Is that what he said? It's not what he said, is it? He says, you're no longer going to worship in this mountain. You're going to worship other places, right? That you don't even understand. Beyond the mountain, it's not going to be one place, is what he's saying. And so he says, man must worship in spirit. And before we were born again, our spirit was dead, not connected with God, separated from God. We had a spirit, but it was separated from God. It was not connected to the life-giving spirit. And then we, we became believers. We were born again. Now, all of a sudden, our inner spirit, the spirit that God gave us, is now connected with the life-giving spirit, and we become alive to God, right? You were dead in sin. Now you're alive in Christ. You're alive to him. So even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And so in order to truly worship God, you need to be saved. And I think that's what he's saying. You need to be born again. You need to be able to worship God from your spirit outward. Not faking it. And so if you're not a believer and you're worshiping God, does it keep you from hell? If you're singing a song and you're not a believer and you haven't accepted the Lord and, and you haven't been given new life, are all of a sudden you translated to heaven? No, you're just singing a song because you like the tune, right? And so I think from the context, that's where you need to come to. You must worship from your new spirit, from who you have become in Christ. You must be saved in order for God to receive your worship. Does that make sense? A lot more sense than just pegging it on a gift of the spirit, right? And it's beyond that. So you may praise God with your tongues. Well, awesome. Obviously, you need to be saved to be able to do so. But I don't think it limits it to that. I think you worship God from your spirit, whether it's in a tongue or whether it's with your 
your actions, whatever it is, it affects everything that you do. And so you must worship God in spirit because he is the life-giving spirit that you now have a relationship with. And, and so you must worship the Lord in spirit. And so worship is something that first takes place inside of you, and then it shows outside of you. Not limited to a location, no longer limited to a temple, not limited to Broadfield Road on Sunday mornings. It's your inner person, and are you bowing, loving, and serving the Lord from your spirit? Now, the idea of truth is, truth is that which corresponds with reality. Okay, that's the definition of truth. It's a classic definition of truth. Truth is that which corresponds with reality. So when you worship God, you must worship God as a born-again believer from your heart, from your spirit. But you also need to worship God in truth and not with lies. So truth in this instance, I believe it takes two forms. Truth about who God is and who you are worshiping and truth about who you are and where you're worshiping from and where you're allowed to worship from right? Who is God and who are you? And so you must worship God in truth. And again, in that passage, he says, you guys are wrong because you're worshiping on this mountain. And God said to worship him where I set up the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. That's where you worship me. That's where you go three times a year. But you guys decided to change that. You're wrong. And what you're saying is, God, bend to my needs and you're going to receive worship the way I want you to. Really? Try that with your boss. Try that with your commanding officer. We ain't going to work too well, right? And we're talking about God, and that's what they were doing, and that's what a lot of people do. I remember we were down at Cole Park many years ago, and, and uh, we were trying to share with people. So I go, oh, there's some people that need the Lord. You know, and you, get, you got this, like, teenage guy smoking a cigarette, and his hand is hanging over his girlfriend's shoulder, and she's you know, barely has a top on, and they're just looking all bad, you know? And I'm going, yeah, they need the Lord. And I go up there, and uh, I start sharing with him, and he goes, you know what? I got to deal with God. We're tight. (laughs) And I'm like, really? Okay, you don't know my God. And and so people think that, right? You need to worship God in truth for who he is. You know, so a proper view of truth or a proper view of the teachings of God. You know what the teachings of God are called? That boring word doctrine. Doctrine. But understand, guys, doctrine is actually very important because all it means is teaching, and it identifies who God is for us. So you can go to a church that worships for two hours and has a 10-minute Bible study. That's no good. Because the thing is, worship is way more than just the music and the song and the activities that are taking place during worship and the banners and the wave flags and all the dancing. And everything. Worship is so much more than that. But if you're not getting to know who God is, what are you worshiping? Are you worshiping him for who he really is? And false doctrines mess up people's worship because they're worshiping not in truth. You know, the Mormons teach that Jesus is a God, but it also teaches that you have the potential to be a God yourself, and he's just one of many gods, and he's actually the brother of Lucifer that had a better plan for, it, for their God, and it's just this chain of gods. And they teach that salvation is by Jesus Christ only to a point, and then after that you need to become a good Mormon in order to inherit your own planet and become a God. Is that what the Bible says? And if you worship God under this, are you actually worshiping God? So you must worship God in truth. Doctrine is important. Okay, and I don't nitpick with a Presbyterian or a Reformed person or whatever, because there's an orthodoxy where we, you know, we agree each other are saved. We just don't agree necessarily on the details of process, and we, we both get it from the scriptures, and it's a difference of opinion. This is out there. And this causes people to worship someone and try to be saved by someone who can't possibly save them, and it sends people to hell. You know, and so there are differences within you know, minute doctrines, but as soon as it sends per- someone to hell, that becomes a cult, and that's what happens. There are others that make God their genie, right? If you say it, God has to do it, really. Uh-huh. He ain't your genie. He's God. Remember, you're supposed to bow down and surrender to him, or God's my homeboy, you know? <laughs> they lower God to their worldly standard, you know, and, and I used to think, oh, God's a homeboy, you know, or whatever, And then I'm thinking, that attitude shouldn't last very long. You know, if you get a teenager on fire with God and they say, God's my homeboy, 
you know, that's one thing. But if you have a guy that's been walking with the Lord for 40 years and has gray in his temples, and he's saying, God's my homeboy, he's got a problem with God, you know? Others say God is limited, and they command or demand that he do certain things. And so the Samaritans, they had these twisted truths. He corrects that, and he says, no, you're worshiping in the wrong place. You're not worshiping the way I told you to worship. But worship would change, and worship has to be done now in spirit through a saved person and in truth based on who I am. But spirit is also, or truth also has to deal with who you are. Because you know what he says to her? In verse 16, he says, call your husband. Remember, she was busted. She'd have five marriages and divorce, probably has kids all over the place, probably sleeping with a lot of men, a lot of adultery going on, and now the man she's living with, she's living in fornication with, the sixth guy. He says, call your husband. He's saying, okay, this is the truth of the matter. I'm offering you living water. You don't deserve it, but you need to understand I am offering it. Isn't that what he did with all of us? You don't deserve it, but I'm offering it, and you can take it freely, and you're going to change, and you're going to be filled with living water, and you're going to spill out your living water all over everybody else. And it's so cool to know who you are and where you're from and to know that God will actually use you and entrust you with the life-giving gospel. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? Wow. So it requires that you be honest about yourself and in your proper place. And you can't put up a front before God. As much as you try, he still knows. And we live our life trying to impress people, being people pleasers, and most of us are. Most of us are. Most of us want to be liked, and we try to impress people. You know, we put on deodorant in the morning. We brush our teeth. You know, I glued my tooth. It keeps on falling out in my face, so you guys be, be impressed that I have nice teeth. You know, it's like we're always trying to impress But God knows. It doesn't fly with God. He knows who you really are. So when you come to him, you don't try to schmooze him. You come to him, God, this is who I am. But the cool thing is, last part there, it says God loves you even though he knows everything about you. And that's the naked and unashamed part of God. And that's the coolest thing because if he knows everything about me, he knows more about me than I even know about myself. And I've deluded myself against who I really am. And he knows who I really am, right? Because we lie about ourselves to ourselves. And we sometimes start to believe it, don't we? And he knows the lies that we even believe about ourselves. He knows it's better than we know ourselves. And he, know, he knows all the sins we've ever done that I've even forgotten about myself. He still knows, but he's forgiven them. And the cool thing about God is he isn't trapped by time. And so he knows all the sins I would ever do. And he still reached out to me and said, you can have living water and I could put it in your vessel. How cool is that? I love that. And that makes me more excited about God instead of less. I don't have to walk around like a peacock and try to prove that I'm something. Because Paul said, I glory in my infirmities that God might be more glorified in me. God uses the weak to shame the strong, the unwise to shame the wise. Why do we always try to act wise? Why do we always try to act strong? When God uses more, if we are weak and stupid, you know? And so, man, we all, the truth is, God is incredible. God wants to use us, and we're not. And it's the coolest thing. He knows everything about you. But you're not going to get anywhere with him by pretending to be something you're not. Honesty is everything. What are you worshiping God for? Because remember, simply, now all of a sudden, it makes it simple. doesn't spirit and truth. What does that mean? Books are written about that. They never mention these things, which are in the context and point to the answer. You must worship not on these mountains anymore. You're going to be worshiping in spirit and in truth. And and, 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 and truth involves who God really is. I am he. I am the fountain of living water. I'm offering this for you. Truth is truth about him, and truth is truth about you. So why do you worship God? For what he can give you? Because you enjoy it and it makes you feel good? Because your friends worship? Or for some impression that you made up about him? false belief or doctrine listen i worship god and he does give me incredible things right things i can't buy i do worship god and i do enjoy it and i do feel good when i worship god but that's not why i worship god because sometimes when i don't feel good i still worship god because he's worthy of worshiping whether i feel like it or not right Because my friends worship? Oh, yeah, I like to hang out with people that love to worship. That's cool, right? 
or for some impression that you made up about him or some false belief or doctrine. And that's where truth comes in. And you know, the, the funniest thing is, God has always received my worship because he cleansed me in the blood of Jesus. But you know what? Over the last 28 years of studying God's word and teaching God's word, I've learned I was wrong a lot. And he loved me even when I was wrong. And so all these things are important and all these things are, are, are true, but is my heart bowed down, l- surrendered to, loving, desiring to be intimate with him for who he really is and his radical, proven love for me? And that means whether I have cancer and I'm, it's terminal and I'm going to die, I can still worship God until the moment I see him face to face. Right? Because it's for who he is, not my situation. It's for who he is, not based upon my emotions. And I tell you what, God loves to bless us as we worship him. But even if I'm not blessed at the moment, he is still worthy of my worship, and I will worship. And then he will bless me anyway. See how that works? Oh, Tozer, worship is to feel in your heart and express in some some appropriate manner a humbling but delightful sense of admiring awe and astonished wonder an overpowering love in the presence of the most ancient mystery, that majesty uh, which philosophers call the first cause, but which we call our Father, which art in heaven. Oh, yeah, we get to worship. Let's close in a little bit of worship today. What do you guys think? Dear God, may you just bless this time, not because we're in a building, but because, Lord, you have challenged us to be worshipers 24-7, and we want to start right now. May we reassess why we do what we do out in the world. May it be that all things are done as unto you, whether we eat or drink. Lord, whatever job we go to, whatever person we talk to, may it be a form of glorifying you in the sense whether it just be through our silent in our heart attitude towards you that will come out in our ethics that we live in front of people, or whether it be a shout and a hallel before people, whatever it be, God, may we be those that show that you are a God that is worth worshiping today. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to close.